Welcome to Podcasts Across Worlds. I'm your host, Lehua Superfina. And I'm One Eye. We are people who like to read a lot of manga and watch a lot of anime. We realize that we all like similar titles and we could talk about them for hours. So here we are in Podcasts Across Worlds to talk about anime, manga, and everything else we're interested in. In this episode of Podcasts Across Worlds, we are going to talk about an anime called Air Master, recommended by One Eye. One Eye, would you like to explain what Air Master is about? Oh, uh, sure. So, Air Master is the kind of anime you didn't see for a while. Um, it's only now picking up with the popularity of shows like uh, Kingen Ashura and Baki. Uh, thanks to Netflix. It is a martial arts anime centering around street fighting and uh, featuring characters that I could best describe as see, even the first time I couldn't remember the word. Um, eccentrics. Yes. A show where literally every character is some brand of eccentric. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And some of them seem really random, really random when they're introduced in the anime. But they made it work. It worked out. Yeah, they all seem to share a very similar brand of madness. Like, I want to say, not every character, but a lot of the characters at least once have this moment where they're screaming at someone about their, like, reason for being. And then the other is just looking at them blankly, like, what the hell is going on? Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even characters who had done this prior are looking at other people doing it to them. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) So in this anime, we have this girl named Maki. She's a high school girl who is a street fighter known as Air Master. She's undefeated and she's always challenged by people because they want to defeat the undefeated. Like, she's always being challenged, and it's, like, a variety of people. Kind of a villain of the week type format. Yeah! It's, like, flavor of the day kind of thing. Mm. It's it's always something different. (laughs) Yeah, in this part of town, it's probably, like, flavor of the hour, because street fights are popping off nonstop. Yeah, like, everywhere in the city, in, like, the dark alleys. There's mm-hmm. always a fight somewhere. <laughs> well, sometimes it's even like right in the middle of a crowded street. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's how the first fight we see in the series starts. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that one, that one was kind of like giving me some unsure impression about this show. Oh, that's mm-hmm. right. Okay, let me let me explain why I was unsure about this. Okay, because one mm-hmm. got Renge, who was a short character who cried and had a really grating voice. Mm-hmm. Two, we had Mina, who had huge boobs that jiggled all the time. Yeah, her boobs were about as big as Renge's head, <laughs> and she got caught. In some type of thing we with these two guys. <clears throat> no, it wasn't even that. It was later. Later on, those two guys. Mm-hmm. But she was there. And for some reason, when Rangi was holding like her toys that she got from the arcade, these two guys, I'm going to call them Yankees because it kind of reminded me of that. <laughs> They're definitely Yankees. Hooligans. Let's call them hooligans. These two hooligans. Well- Apparently, apparently, one of them was obsessed with that stuffed toy. Yeah, and, well, he had a couple of them, like, dangling or sitting on his shoulder or something like that. Yeah, like, he collects them. That's his thing. He's like, oh, mm-hmm. I like to collect these things. And He also liked to collect cigarettes. He had, like, three in his mouth at any given moment. Yeah! And then they noticed Mina and her boobs. So that whole scene, I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> you're kind of hit. You're kind of bombarded with weirdness in that first episode. <laughs> like even before you meet Maki, like if you didn't watch the intro and just kind of like went into this completely blind, you'd be really confused. 
And the way they introduce Maki too, that one person who's really tall comes up behind silently and with her deeper female voice is like, I can help you. And they're all like, who the F is this? She's so scary looking. She has an RBF. You know, she got no emotion. She looks like she's going to pick someone up. But then she's like, I'll help you get that toy. <laughs> it's like it's like one of those characters that are really big and scary, but they have a soft side of them. Like they like Yeah. Them. Very gooey yeah. center. Like the first time you see him, every part of them is like silhouette. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh god, something scary's gonna happen. And mm-hmm. then they like offer you candy or something. Right. Or like they offer you something that they made themselves. They're like, yes, mm-hmm. I make this. <laughs> Yeah, so that first episode, everything just seemed so comedic. And I was expecting like a fighting anime like Baki, but then there's like so much comedy. And I was like, I don't know what to think about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, no, wait, no, wait, one, I suggested this. I need to watch this. So I kept watching it. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, I'm liking this. I'm liking this. Yeah, where the uh, similarities with Baki come in is primarily not just in the fights themselves, but in the impact. Uh, you know, usually in the anime about like fighting or martial arts, there'll be something distinctive about them. And in the case of Air Master, it's it's really the hits because these these people get hit hard and hit often, and and there's something like weirdly satisfying about the impact. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So Maki is called Air Master because she uses aerial techniques, which comes from her gymnastic days. So she uses her skills as a gymnast and applies it to street fighting. And that's how she became Air Master. And she likes to use her legs. Bruh. Mm -hmm. Fits from legs are already hard, and she's using the momentum of the spin kicks, air kicks, whatever kicks. Oh man, they are like crushing the face. You see the wrinkles of the skin as like her foot is pushing it <laughs> towards that direction. That's what I was talking about when I was saying impact. <laughs> like, like I'm pretty sure like twenty percent of the animation budget goes into every hit. <laughs> And, like, I get impressed where she somehow she develops, like, different techniques. Like, for example, when she fights that that lucha master, mm-hmm. that wrestler, where she's like, okay, some of these moves aren't really working. And so she starts, like, spinning more, creating more mm-hmm. momentum, putting in more power in her kicks. I was like, dang, girl! Yeah, they kind of uh, really set something up by having the first person she fight be a luchador because uh, even in real life, the uh, hallmark of a luchador is their ability to sort of take to the air and use acrobatics. So Lucha Master is basically what Maki does as a like tried and tested fighting style. So how you're putting her up against that like right out the gate just kind of lets you know like this is her domain. And um like the idea of like crossing gymnastics with uh martial arts, I think it's been done on occasion, primarily in uh like like martial arts movies. Mm-hmm, There's mm-hmm. a film called Jim Kata that I think was about it, and um at least one other film. Where it was the same thing, where you had like a gymnast then become a martial artist, and um, you know, and then there's other styles that like mix the two. Like uh, capoeira is another one that uh, utilizes um, acrobatics alongside uh, physical combat. But uh, Maki's style is decidedly unique in that it seems to be more um, like things like um, lucha libre and uh, capoeira appear to be how do I put this like like there's a lot of aerial stuff in capoeira but it's kind of like 
more dancing in martial arts and maybe a dance first and a martial arts second. Mm-hmm. Likewise, uh, Lucha Libre is like wrestling first and acrobatics second. Uh, Maki style is acrobatics first and Mm -hmm. then combat. Down to the fact that (laughs) after a lot of her attacks, she'll like in like like have like a win pose. That's basically you know that stance you go into when you finish your floor routine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She always does that. I did wonder how did she start as a gymnast and end as a street fighter? Because mm-hmm. when it was explained that she was a gymnast, my thoughts were like, wait, how did this happen? Like, if you were a gymnast where it looked like she was winning, it looked like she was being a champion. Mm-hmm. And then she becomes a street fighter, a really good street fighter. I was like, wondering, like, wait, where, where is that? What happened in the middle? And then they show that her mom died. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, okay, so that was that was the catalyst. Her mom dies and she loses her drive to be a gymnast. Okay. But then still, why did she become a street fighter? That 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 still didn't explain to me. I was like, but why mm-hmm. a street fighter? Like gymnast, you think of like feminine, delicate, yet they can do all these moves that require a lot of muscle power Mm -hmm. similar to dance where it's decidedly physical but has an element of grace to it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you get to street fighting where it's really rough it's bloody it's brutal it's often not pretty (laughs) right right and then as the story goes on like every time she's fighting someone they kind of hint at She's trying to find a emotion, like a mm-hmm. thrill. Like she's looking for that thrill mm-hmm. and not feeling it with these opponents. And like I said before, all these people keep challenging her. And she's like, okay, I'll fight you. Bring it. Mm-hmm. And she's just doing it because she can. And then later on, it shows that she's looking for that feeling with these opponents. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Like uh, early in the show, she she's kind of describes it as chasing a sort of tension. Yes. The kind of like tension, the kind of uh, unease and worry that she'd have before she would go to, I don't know what you'd call it, like a gymnastics uh, meet or something like that, a competition. And uh, once she you know, starts fight, finding these opponents that really test her, really challenge her. Uh, it becomes clear that she's sort of like looking for that, that feeling you get when you overcome like a challenge or something like that, sort of like going to that competition and getting first place or like completely acing your routine or whatever it is. She, she needed, she needed both the the challenge, the thrill of victory, or even the sort of struggle of defeat, and just the release of, you know, the physical release, the emotional release, everything. I find it interesting when they introduce that, that that's what she was looking for in these fights, because before, mm-hmm. when she's fighting these people, these eccentric fighters, She's actually have she actually has to like change the way she fights. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think you said this before. She's adapting to them, and yeah, getting that aha moment. She's like, oh, if I do this, I can counterattack them. Like she's Mm -hmm. having those moments, and every time she's fighting a new opponent, opponent, and adapting, it's like leading her to that. Oh, am I getting close to that? to that thrill, to that Mm -hmm. missing emotion. Mm -hmm. Then they get a revelation. Like, oh, she's looking for that. Mm -hmm. She's she's basically basically chasing that athlete's high she used to get through gymnastics. Athlete high. (laughs) That's the best way I can think to describe it. She wants that jitters feeling, that nervousness. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, you latched on something interesting with her being able to kind of like adapt in these situations where, um, you know, her, her experience is primarily through gymnastics. Um, we later find out that she maybe has some martial arts experience or at least some idea of what to do with her arms and legs in regards to combat due to her father being a successful and professional martial artist. However, what what she's really kind of like uh, going on is the Maki is falls into the category or archetype of the uh, genius character. Uh, I think the Japanese word they would use is the uh, tensai, tensai archetype, what have you. And it's not genius so much in intellect as in a uh, just human capacity. Uh, the hallmark of a character like this is being able to copy basically well, more so being able to learn things quickly and utilize it um, in like martial arts, anime and sports anime. It's usually being able to copy moves either on site or after having, you know, little practice with them. And you'll see Maki do that over the course of this series. Sometimes, copying a move that was just done to her she just saw on the same person that did it <laughs> which i liked i really liked that <laughs> some of those instances were kind of kind of cold <laughs> i know it was like oh girl that was a bird well, like she she does that to kai a lot and that's <laughs> it's kind of cold <laughs> Like I, I think I think Kai's a much nicer person than the series kind of lets on for how how much of that she's able to forgive in Maki. <laughs> uh, describe Kai to the audience. What is uh, Kai? Like? Uh, Sampagita Kai is the younger sister of Lucha Master, and she stands out. I mean, on the topic of uh, archetypes. She's, I mean, it's a fighting anime, so technically, like, every character is a rival. But she's specifically the rival that does what the main character does. So, like, much like a Lucha Master, she is a Luchador as well, however. Whereas um, Lucha Master, he's revealed to nearly be 40 and kind of, like, losing a step just due to age. Mm -hmm. uh, Kai's definitely still kind of like similar to Maki still kind of like reaching for her like the, like the peak of her potential mm -hmm. like they both have an insane amount of room to grow and Kai is shown to be the only character that can really keep up with Maki in the air that's right yeah they have uh, what is arguably one of the best fights in the series specifically a sequence where they literally like <laughs> jump high enough to almost touch the um not not the ceiling um the the like the sort of like scaffolding lights you have at the top of an, uh, an indoor arena mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. literally fight all the way down yeah that was a good one i like the mm -hmm. build up for that mm -hmm. because before maki even meets her maki's fighting like all these random people or oh, as yeah. one i said it very nicely eccentric Fighters. Oh, they're lunatics. <laughs> the, the town is full of lunatics. It's like a street fighters like haven. Like there are street fights popping off that have nothing to do with the characters in the show. They just happen in the background half the time. Suffice to say, yes, they're they're all crazy. Maki included. Even though they're like all crazy and they seem random, they actually have their own story like we actually mm -hmm. start liking them and we're rooting for them in our own way yeah for they're example, mm -hmm. for example kaori sakiyama <laughs> sakiyama sakiyama oh i love that <laughs> uh though no, i love that yeah no i love that too she she might be my favorite character in the whole series <laughs> Like she, so she's introduced as a an aspiring model slash entertainer, mm -hmm. and the way she's introduced was random. 
They meet at a indoor pool place. She's doing a very low budget photo shoot mm-hmm. and Maki somehow takes all the attention, the spotlight, and Kaori gets mad. She gets mad <laughs> and she looks up Maki, finds out that she's a street fighter, and then she goes and challenges Maki to street mm-hmm. fighting. And it's like, what are you doing? You are she a wants, model. She wants to upstage the person that upstaged her. Right? She's like so prideful. She's like, how dare you upstage me in getting attention? I will upstage you in fighting then. I'll take your thunder. Mm-hmm. And Maki just beats her ass. <laughs> like, Kaori thought she was being so smart because... Mm-hmm. She learned that Maki is known as Air Master, so she needs open air, open space, right? No, no, so this I- was this was solid thinking. Like credit where credit is due, this was not a bad plan. No, it was not a bad plan. No, it wasn't. Like I thought, Kaori was being really smart. I was like, "Ooh, girl!" So Kaori challenges challenges her in like in a tunnel that's like leading yeah. to the subway. I think so. She yeah. Challenges her in a tunnel with a low ceiling. So she's like, ha, 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 ha. You can't do your aerial techniques now. There's a low ceiling. Well, then Maki proved her and us wrong because Maki does like this breakdancing move. She's well, like, yeah. She uh, basically in. does some stuff she'd have probably done on like the balance beam. Where she's like, she, she, she basically does like the spinning bird kick. Yeah. <laughs> And that's where Maki's like adapting. Mm-hmm. Skill comes along. She's like, bring it. Throw anything at me. I'll take it. I'll counter mm-hmm. you. Yeah, it's 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 the sort of situation that um because Maki was chasing the attention. It's the sort of thing she's thriving. She literally wants to be backed into a corner. She kind of wants that that fear, that anxiety, that worry, so she can potentially overcome it. Mm-hmm. Which is half the reason why she's crazy. Yeah, she's a little obsessed with that. Mm-hmm. And Kaori is just obsessed with fighting Maki. She's like, mm-hmm. like, even though she gets defeated, she comes back. Yeah, I think I think half of what people would love about her is that determination. <laughs> That she won't let anything stop her, no matter how insane or insurmountable. Like I was, I was a little suspicious that she was that one character that always challenged our protagonist to a fight mm-hmm. and view them as a rival, and mm-hmm. that was just that was their life, sort of like Goku and Vegeta, where Kaori was like Vegeta, mm-hmm. always wanting to defeat Goku. And I was a little worried that Maki was going to be like, oh, I don't really view you as a rival. I don't really think of you that much. And then Kaori would be like so heartbroken. She's like, what? I put my heart and soul. I I train. I improve my fighting techniques. Mm-hmm. I like strengthen my body. I work so hard. And you think of me like this? What? But they end up becoming friends. Yeah. It's... um. The, the tragic element is that um, the stride Sakiyama make makes in this show would be enough to make her the main character in any other anime. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think if she were fighting anyone but Maki, she may have been able to. She may have been able to beat them. But um, Maki is just a effing monster, and she does this to like. The entire cast is basically like varying degrees of Vegeta where Maki is concerned because she does that to just about everyone she encounters. <laughs> she does. <laughs> Though to Sakiyama's credit, she does become like she she is she does kind of exist in Maki's head just as both like a friend and I don't know, some she's almost like a life coach to her at times in like the weirdest ways possible. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Where like uh, Maki is feeling down or 
she's feeling insecure about something. She's questioning herself. And then Sakiyama, Kaori Sakiyama comes along. She's like, what are you doing? You're my rival. You Get your be- act together. Oh. Smack. Right, right. <laughs> like she has those moments. Mm-hmm. Is she she does it more often than any other character in the show. Like Maki will be out of it or in a slump. Or not even necessarily need to be fired up, but get fired up anyway because of uh, Sakiyama either being there or tr- like giving her a pep talk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in her own weird way, Sakiyama is a really good friend. Yeah. If we think about it, she's a better friend than Maki's high school friends. <laughs> Mina, Renge. Well, she's and- decidedly a lot more uh, useful. Though she's also putting herself in the line of fire a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, speaking of Maki's friends, so Maki mm-hmm. has these four high school friends Yu, Michiru, Mina, and Renge. Mm-hmm. You, Michiru, they just seem like normal people, you know, just regular yeah. high girls. They like to go to the arcade. They like to sing karaoke. They're good, wholesome girls. Mm-hmm. And then you get these two <laughs> extreme girls. <laughs> Exaggerated characters. Oh, Lord. Yeah, like they are like concentrations of anime tropes, both um, Ringe and Mina. Ringe being the like the supposedly cute child character and Mina being the fan service character. Renge being a child a cute child character that is not cute and Mina being a fan service character that is completely unappealing. Maybe that's mean, but like those boobs just seem unnatural. Bruh, bruh, those boobs <laughs> were supposed to be unnatural. They were a distraction. Okay, like, like I, I hope Mina's doing some back exercises or something because you know those things are putting a lot of strain on her. Like the the part that I was talking about where there is that first fight scene with the hooligans and the mm-hmm. hooligans notice Mina's boobs. Like all she did was like move her shoulders and like her chest bounces, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, boobs are huge." There's like a three second stabilization rate for like every movement she does. Yeah, like sometimes the show actually zooms in on her boobs. Yeah, she has like unique physics too, because there's that point where I think uh, she falls. I think it was her and uh, Rachi, the uh, BMX Kung Fu kid, where they like fall off a building. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like her boobs, like absorb some of the shock <laughs> from the fall. <laughs> oh goodness! Not gonna lie, I do not like Mina. She is the character oh, I I dislike in mm. every show I watch. Mina was all the characteristics I don't like. For example, mm-hmm. Seven Deadly Sins. There's mm-hmm. this character named Elizabeth, I think. Elizabeth mm-hmm. was that delicate damsel in distress. At I was first. about to say damsel in distress. Yeah, that yeah. they both have that in common. They're damsel constantly being abducted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Big boobs and clumsy. Mm-hmm. Clumsy. Like they they portray themselves like they are incapable of taking care of themselves, like so bad that they trip over their own. Feet. It makes a bit more sense in Mina's case because she, her her balance is not like her weight's not evenly distributed. <laughs> her, 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 she's constantly falling over, and I guess I can understand considering she's like front loaded. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> oh no, I don't like her either. She's probably. Not my least favorite character in the show, but she's definitely up there. She's um, 
her even though there isn't anything necessarily wrong with her voice i find it more grating than renge's really it's not the voice herself it's just the fact that like she screams one thing all the time which is maki chan and she's always screaming it even when there's like no need for it one eye that was also one of the things i dislike she does that damsel in distress scream where she's like screaming for the hero's name like they're mm -hmm. just gonna show up or they scream their name when they're like concerned worry about them and it's like can you do anything else besides yeah. maybe because in the show they show that mina does have a army of bodyguards yeah she she she's uh from a rich family right so i'm thinking mina honey why can't you just call up those bodyguards and if you got a phone <laughs> You look for Maki to help her. Huh? Huh? Why like, you gotta... like, like I'm pretty sure that's why she's not calling the bodyguards. Like like she's just using that as another means to get Maki to Maki 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 to sort of focus on her. Oh goodness. Is, and Mina, Mina's got a one track mind. And Mina does get kidnapped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, nonstop. Sometimes without even meaning to or realizing it. And then, yeah, that was, sorry, go ahead. No, you go, you go. I was going to say it, it, it took my third viewing of this series to kind of realize that there is a uh, smaller pattern of that where like the story kind of like uh, takes off or is kind of driven by Maki having to protect Mina. It's not like every source of conflict but it happened way more often than i remembered <laughs> i do remember that mina get kidnapped but i only remember one kidnapping oh the, the uh one. the uh yeah the big one the the one is like a story arc <laughs> yeah the uh, black suited gentleman slash the society of like honor or, or justice and sincerity or something like that. Yeah, I want to talk about that later on because that was a, that was an old whole thing. Really, they it, they they really feel like they wandered in from a separate anime. Because <laughs> uh, I want to talk about Range now. Mm -hmm. Like I know you uh, talked about her, but she was one of my favorite characters like she started off as being a character i didn't like because she just reminded me of all the characters i got annoyed with mm -hmm. and but then all those characteristics became endearing like i didn't like renge's voice at first because it was a greeting kind of high pitch rough sounding old lady voice coming yeah. from a childlike figure and then they made her eyes huge and then they made her mouth huge when she was talking i was like why yeah why? it's, it's kind of like uh how the the voice actress or goku is this old lady but when she's voicing goku it's this really high-pitched voice Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of like that if you like rub like or like ran it through sandpaper. <laughs> and she yells and she screams. And Rangi she cries. A lot. Yes, yes. And that I that was the first episode. That mm -hmm. was the first episode. I was like, oh, I don't like her. <laughs> Please tell me we're not gonna spend a lot of time with her. <laughs> No, 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 no. But then as I watch her some more and see how her crying kind of like drives people to do things. Like she's crying like she wants to eat somewhere. So they're like, okay, we'll eat at this place. Mm -hmm. Or like some of the other characters that like pop in, they're like, oh no, I'm so sorry. And it's like, oh, that character doesn't seem as bad as they first showed up as because mm -hmm. they showed up as a jerk that wanted to fight, but they actually like Renge. Okay, you're cool. If you like her, 
You're good. You're a good person. <clears throat> and then there's like parts. Okay, Renge is also a gluten. So there are parts where Renge is like, I'm hungry. And then someone offers to buy her food. She's like, oh, really? And all the other girls, high school girls, are like, food, yes, free food, yes. Mm -hmm. So that gluten -y part of Renge helped in the story. Hmm. You know, you did, I think with both of those, you kind of latch on to something with interest something of interest with a uh, Renge and that she is kind of like a, uh, kind of like an arbiter of morality in that show. Like she ends up uh, being the reason why a uh, number of characters befriend the group, namely uh, Sakiyama and um, uh, Ski Sukio, Skino, the uh, jackhammer dude. And in both cases, I think it relates to food. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think Sakiyama was trying to get information from Renge and bought her, bought her dinner. Or she bought the whole group dinner as an apology for something. And then she gives Eskino what little money she had in her pocket so he could buy breadcrumbs. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, she, she's a surprisingly moral character, even though they kind of like to depict her as being very self-interested. Like kind of having the one track mind of I want to eat something. Yeah, she did. Um, she did seem like that, but it worked in the story's favor because uh, there's this one part where uh, Shiro, Maki's mm -hmm. dad, was talking mm -hmm. to this guy. I forget who this guy was, but oh, the uh, the third ranked uh, grappler dude. Yes, 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 yes. The third rank uh, fighter. So they were like in a yakiniku place or something like that. It was a Korean barbecue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was Korean barbecue. They even said it. So they're at a Korean barbecue place. And then all of a sudden, the girls show up. And Ring is like, I'm hungry. Feed me. It's <laughs> like, and no, I'm not going to feed you. Papa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the third rank guy was looking for Maki. And because Rengi was hungry, and she's like, Papa, feed me, it somehow brought them all together. <laughs> well, he, he wanted it, it's a funny thing with like the crying. Like it, it's supposed it's normally supposed to be, oh, you feel bad because you made a little kid cry, so you'll do what they want. But often in Rengi's case, it's because her crying was so grating, they just wanted it to stop. <laughs> but yeah, in that case, it's because she kept calling he told Maki that he would treat her and her friends if she called him Papa. Even mm -hmm. though like Rocky refuses to acknowledge him as her father. Probably because he's so immature. But uh, Renge wanting food decides to start calling him Papa and he treats them to make her stop. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good mm -hmm. episode. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, that that's that is a weird thing. It's funny that it took me watching three times to like pick up on that. But um Yeah, she's she's the source of a lot of positivity in spite of her being kind of an obnoxious character. Like it's it's not she's pulling people in because she's the cute character. She's pulling people in because she just does right by people, even though all she's really focused on is food. 90% of the time, food mm -hmm. and her cat. Um, she's, I, I mean, I, I guess I like that. There's there's kind of a hidden depth to her character, which uh, almost runs counter to her being like a parody of the cute child character. Um, if there was some hidden depth to Mina, I couldn't find it. Nope, none. <laughs> none. I literally thought Mina and Renge as like satire characters. <laughs> like they're yeah. like of mm -hmm. other shows. <laughs> I was like, That's what they felt like to me. Yeah, it, it definitely felt like that. And it's funny in the case of Renge, because if she's like in a critique of the Moe blob, then she actually kind of comes into play before the big boom of Moe shows, like before they became like the primary before they became what you thought of when you thought of anime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
which would be in like the the later aughts, closer to the end when um the market kind of uh I don't know if it like oversat. I think it kind of oversaturated in the states and needing needing reliable money became more of a factor outside of uh, the U.S. So they were kind of anime became geared towards the diehards, and the diehards were all about moe at the time. <laughs> I just viewed Renge as that short comedic mm-hmm. character that yeah. every show needs. Every show needs it. Yeah. But Renge did end up having more depth. I do agree with that. Just like a lot of these characters, like even You're though- not expecting it with a lot of these characters, especially when they show up and the first thing they do is just start screaming or hitting or both. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're not expecting for there to be a lot of lot there psychologically or just emotionally or whatever. You're not expecting like big arcs or a lot of like hidden depth there, but you get a surprising amount in a small amount of time. Yeah, we did touch on how like all these fighters they can have their own story. Mm-hmm. Like Kaori Sakiyama, like she could definitely have her own story. If Maki wasn't mm-hmm. there, she would have been the protagonist. Oh yeah, she could have been. She could easily be the main character of a completely of like a even just like a slightly different anime. It's very much like a fighting game where every character is made as though they were the main character of their own series, and. A lot of the characters have that pull, if not as the main character, then as the primary antagonist for someone else. Like, um, was that that group of like black gentlemen? The black suited gentlemen, the alliance of justice and sincerity, or something like that. Bruh, that felt like a a show crossover yeah they felt like they wandered in from like otoko juku or crows or any of those shows any of those just like delinquent shows yeah it was like so random too it was like what are you why yeah they they show up with their own cast of characters they did and like there's like a story in that group, mm-hmm. like like a oh, what was the leader's name? Oh, shit. Uh, Kenjiro. Even his name, Kenjiro. Kenji. How many protagonists? Mm-hmm. How many characters are named Kenji? Yeah. <laughs> and like he was the leader, and his thing was like punching, right? Yeah, he was basically like an evolved brawler. His uh, two hallmarks were speed and punching. Basically, he can <laughs> he goes really hard in a single direction, which is not only a description of how he fights, but also just the kind of person he is. And he's like so strong that he can fight against animals in the mountains. Like mm-hmm. he even killed a bear, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, there's a little more to that than that. I think their their school is located in Hokkaido. Which is uh, home to some like really harsh winters and a really big population of like giant ass mammoth animals. <laughs> like usually, when you have uh, extreme conditions, the animals either get bigger or more ferocious. Kind of like polar bears out in the Arctic; they're they're actually giant, fucking enormous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So all those animals he's fighting are like extra powerful so like before him he just i felt like that thing was so random how he popped in but and i was like looking at like what show are you from like (laughs) (laughs) why are you here yeah if someone had told me that that arc was crossed over with another anime i'd have believed it because they like they even have their own dedicated like like background characters like like 
character designs you see in the background with those characters that you never see after they leave. There is one character that I felt was kind of neglected. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about him because I was just like, I feel bad for him. Shinosuke Tokita. Yeah, I liked him a lot. And yeah, he's barely there. He's in there for like the first couple of episodes. And then he quite literally fucks off to China. Yeah, yeah. He, He... He's introduced. He seems like a wholesome guy. He fights with a long staff. He's like, I want to challenge you, Maki. I want to be stronger. He's and- the only one to give her like a formal challenge. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, he was, he, he challenged her through what, a website? The newspaper? Through a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I don't know how to contact her. So I'll just do like a very broad. <laughs> Hopefully she'll see it. <laughs> Challenge. I'll, I'll put an ad in the paper and wait here patiently. <laughs> <laughs> and he ends up liking her. And so I'm thinking, okay, a romance is going to develop. Yeah. And then he just leaves for China. I was like, what? What? Yeah, he gets jobbed out too many times. And I guess he decides to go on like a training expedition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I feel like in the manga you probably get to see him come back with like a, like like a you know a power boost. It seemed like they're gonna come. He he was gonna come back. It seemed like he was gonna come back because mm-hmm. this, uh, I think it was Fukumichi kept yeah. saying, "Oh, he's out there getting stronger," mm-hmm. and like he scenes of Shinosuke getting like training, getting stronger, and it's like, "Oh yeah, he's gonna come back." But we don't see him coming yeah. back in the anime. In the anime, he doesn't. The last thing we see of him is him like looking like he's about to face off with a tiger. I was like, man. Yeah, I, I, I liked him from the start. He was just kind of like a nice change of pace for all, from all the like loud screaming people. But yes. I think it, it, it's during the... Um, the arc with the black suited gentleman where he uh, reveals he has some experience with the drunken, drunken boxing. Oh yeah. (laughs) That's right. Drunk Shinosuke is best Shinosuke. (laughs) (laughs) Like down to the fact that he tries to confess his feelings to Maki, but he's like slurring his words so hard. And no one can make sense out. of what he's saying. <laughs> but he passes out. Poor T. Well, yeah, I, um, I think he just drank way too much too fast. Because <laughs> he downed that whole flask. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I got to hope that, like, it was, like, beer or wine or something in there. God forbid there was hard liquor in there because that kid probably almost died if that was the case. Mm-hmm. Another character I want to talk about is Julieta Sakamoto. Oh, yeah. That guy. <laughs> I thought he was so interesting. I was so piqued by him. I was like, why is he so strong? Mm-hmm. And so he just, okay, so when he's introduced, it's this is also random and weird. I thought he was a host because he just went up to Maki and was starting to like hit on her and was asking her out to a meal and he wanted yeah. to buy her stuff. And I was like, he's so creepy. Yeah, like he was, he was, uh, you went all in. He's a uh, pretty suavely dressed. So I thought he was going to be like, like the ladies' man type character when I first mm-hmm. saw him, mm-hmm. but he, he he you know he starts coming on way too strong, and mm-hmm. uh, he's probably the only character up until that point I should say that got a decent amount of build up. <laughs> like he's, I think he, it, it's his uh, introduction that is like the first actual arc in the series. 
which, you know, they're usually about three episodes long with a recovery episode after the fact. But um, so I was expecting him to be strong. I was not expecting him to kick a girl out of her shoes and then kick a salary man into a second story window. <laughs> like the level of strength this guy has is ridiculous. And some of it shouldn't be surprising because he's actually kind of gigantic. Like he seems to be about as tall as, as Maki mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and is nearly as wide as a car. Like, like he's got an impressive amount of musculature to him in spite of the fact that his uh, everything about his demeanor screams that he doesn't exercise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As a matter I- of fact, like everything seemed to kind of like said about him in regards to fighting indicates that he's got a lot of like like if we can talk about it like like a like a mmo type thing it's like he has a ton of abilities and they're all passive ah which is to say they're all kind of going on and without him needing to call upon it like he talks about being able to block out pain because of like having active control over adrenaline and endorphins like normally that stuff just happens you know, like you, like you start fighting adrenaline, bam, endorphins, bam, whatever. But he can apparently call upon it at will. And then you get a uh, indication later that he also has like unconscious key control and can use it defensively. And he's just gigantic. So it seems like all of the abilities he has that allow him to kick people through like roofs and ceilings and are all things that are kind of happening in him rather than things he's actively doing. He doesn't seem to have any real technique or any sort of martial arts background. And he talks about kicking people as though he's very impulsive. Like even the way he moves is very impulsive. Like he talks about him, like kicking people almost as though it's happening subconsciously, like outside of his own conscious want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it's a bizarre thing where, um, Everything about him as a fighter is fascinating to me, but everything about him as a person is kind of abhorrent. <laughs> so when he was introduced and I saw like his fighting, I was thinking, okay, so he must be a guy who has like a backstory that like he gets into into trouble a lot and he ended up fighting a lot and becoming stronger. You know, because mm-hmm. he looks like, he, like I said, he looked like a host. He looked so I was like, okay, he's a host. Yeah, like he went around okay. stealing people's girlfriends, be it intentionally right. and unintentionally, and he had to learn to fight in order to not die. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then um, we learned that he's a ghost writer, and mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of the activities he does is indoors, surrounded by monitors. And I'm thinking. Where does all that strength come from? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and everything that Wana explained is like, that's it. That's how. That's how he's so powerful. He just has. He's, all- he, he's, a, he's a literal freak. Like everything about him that gives him that strength is not something he's consciously doing. He's it's like it's strength. like all his all abilities power. are. Ha- yeah, all his all that power that he's able to utilize is it's like it's happening to him rather than him utilizing it. And that whole suaveness comes in because he can. He's Apparently, he's very charming because when we see him... <laughs> he's got three girlfriends that <laughs> don't... That, that don't, like, bat an eye to him, like, actively being in love with Maki. They're, they're, they're like a harem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has a literal harem. And they're all successful women. It's not like they're highly successful. Yeah. Like, it's not like they need his attention. They just Mm -hmm. want it. Yeah. You got like a, a, a successful actress, a model and an author. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like they're all like at the top of their field. It's not like there's anything they really want from him outside of, I guess, just him. And, Julieta, he has like an obsession with Maki. Like he wants her. Like something about her kind of like ignites a fire in him. And mm-hmm. 
it reminded him of that feeling he had for this quote, Jenny quote. He says, my Jenny. And all that that he felt at that time, he's like putting it on Maki now. Mm -hmm. Transferred those emotions to her. And he's obsessed with her. And um, even though he's really creepy, he he came up super, super, super strong. I still find him interesting. And because of him, he sort of awakens emotions in in Maki. Like, he makes her realize that she is a girl. Like, she can be vulnerable to men's, a man's, uh, what is it? What is it? Attack? A man's, uh, I don't want to say attack. attack Desires. Like forwardness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, she's um completely clueless in matters such as that. And it doesn't just show in how easily uh Sakamoto is able to get under her skin, but also in just how like um oblivious she is to Mina's affection. Mhm mhm mhm. Like she she almost she either doesn't acknowledge it or is openly confused by like direct declarations of love for her mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like anything related to like romance she's oblivious to it yeah she's either oblivious or terrified of it and she fights julietta and she loses right um kind of it, it doesn't really how do i put this it seems like he may have gotten the upper hand if he hadn't went and tore her shirt off. Ah. Like everything kind of indicates that she wasn't actually ready for ready to face him as a fighter. However, his his he was thinking with his uh wiener. <laughs> so she ran away. And because of Julieta, we are introduced to Maki's dad, Shiro. Mm-hmm. And I was not expecting to see Shiro because I was thinking, yep, yeah, Maki, her mom, that's it. And then all of a sudden her dad pops up. I'm like, wait, what? What? Her dad's around? What? Mm-hmm. And it turns out he's like a pro fighting champion. It's like, what? Yeah. And a what? bit of a playboy himself. And that uh he had him and him and his wife had Maki when he was 16. Mm -hmm. so they don't indicate his mother's age i mean sorry his mother uh maki's mother's age but i like i i suspect that they were just a young couple me too me too yeah i like that maki's dad was introduced because it made sense to everything Mm -hmm. like remember when i said that i was like wondering about the whole transition between being a gymnast to a street fighter. She was the answer. Yeah. Be it consciously or subconsciously. That's another thing she had familiarity with. You know, because I mean, and she's somewhat estranged from him. There's a indication that uh, him and his mother, sorry, him. I keep saying his mother, uh, him and Maki's mother may have like divorced at some point or, Maybe it was just he got up with someone after uh, she passed. But yeah, there's there's some estrangement between the two of them, though I don't know how much of that is the relationship with uh, with Maki's mom or if it was just because Maki thinks her father's an idiot. Uh, there is a decided difference in maturity between Maki's mother and her father, though. Yeah, definitely. From what I could tell from Maki's flashbacks of mm-hmm. her mom, her mom seemed more strict. Mm-hmm. More strict and on schedule? Like like Yeah, she did seem to um she did seem to be decidedly uh more organized, more yes. um yeah. But yes, but not to the oh yes. But not to the point that she wasn't also just a loving and caring mother to Maki. Like she's like she she's she's able to drill her as a coach, but she's still you do get at least like one moment of her like 
just just being kind with her. And then you see Shiro, Maki's dad, and he just seems like a totally relaxed guy. He is a goof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when he's introduced, he's like in this building. It looks like an apartment complex. But, but it's actually out, his dojo. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't look like the guy running the dojo. He doesn't. No. He looks to be about the same age as all of his uh, students. Yeah. So that whole contrast between him and Maki's mom, I can see why it didn't work out, but you kind of got to wonder, how did they get together? <laughs> like, how? But, you know. Could be oh, well. opposites attracting. Yeah. Yeah. Or that the young days, you know. It was a time when Maki's mom didn't know better. Like she mm-hmm. was just following her heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but anyways, I like Shira. I liked how he's funny. Yeah, he's funny. And I was surprised that he could teach Maki. Mm-hmm. Like that part where she's like asking him to fight to fight her because she wants to like learn. Like mm-hmm. What is she missing? What is what's that thing that she needs to do to overcome that fight? Yeah, because to, doing that so she can totally beat up Julietta. Yeah. Well, she knows Julietta is going to be a problem, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. even with their like limited uh, interaction. So she feels like she's she. There may be a step she's kind of missing, so to speak, in regards to being able to fight him. So she goes to her dad for that and. <laughs> Oh, I know why. I know why mm. she went to her dad because her usual moves weren't working for Julieta because oh, Julieta yeah. was taking those hits. Yeah, he was tanking them completely. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah, because he has that like, I guess it's like overactive adrenaline and endorphins or something. Like I kind of suspect they're just going in him nonstop. <laughs> That's right. So Julieta was just tanking her hits and he could just kick her right back. Mm-hmm. And so Maki went to her dad to figure out what she needs to do. And she started mm-hmm. like doing her adapting thing. Mm-hmm. Genius learning. Adapting. Yeah, I think it was fi- maybe it was fighting him. She it was her figuring out how to kind of like redirect momentum from attacks. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So she was able to turn that on uh, Sakamoto. And uh, (laughs) even though it's it's not quite on topic, my favorite part of that fight is the double arm lock. (laughs) (laughs) Just because that seemed to be like the one point where he was actually kind of getting irritated with Maki. Like I'm trying to be nice, god damn it. Uh, I think that's when it started when Maki started uh uh she started to take in other fighting techniques. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think that was like if she wasn't already doing it, then that's when it kind of got like it kind of became a part of her repertoire of just like, okay absorbing other people's techniques and then making them her own. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was also maybe like the first time she's not necessarily challenged, but really kind of like pushed really. It's, it's, it's the point where she finally experiences that tension she was looking for. That's right. She was feeling that with Julieta. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's like near the end of that fight, she acknowledges on some level she's the same kind of crazy as him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's when she starts. So there, there's a for a, a certain number of episodes, I think from this point till her fight with Kai, anytime a fight picks up, Maki starts getting this crazy eye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think like during this period of time, she's kind of experimenting with sadism because she becomes decidedly more brutal. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like almost to a point where it's like you said, like lunatic or obsessed or crazy yeah. to the point where she's like she's on that obsessive drive to look for that moment mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Yeah, she's like scaring her friends doing that too. So it was kind of like a, a, a weird minor arc for Maki that kind of gets resolved once she's able to find opponents that can like push her to that physical limit. Like I think with Sakamoto, it was the psychological limit had been reached, but now she had to find like, like a, a physical challenge as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it seemed like she found, um, she really found it with Kai. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the first time she's really pushed is when she fights Kenjiro. But, uh, more so with Kai, for sure. Because I don't know if Maki goes into what I like to call the fight coma after Kenjiro. Like, I'm pretty sure she's mostly all there after that fight. She's just kind of like... I think she uh, mentions that she she's going to feel like She's gonna take a long shower and sleep real well after the fight with Kenjiro. Like, like she kind of, she's got like a sort of, like she feels rewarded having overcome that fight. But oh, she's like kind of coming down from that high. Yeah, like like that, after that it, the, yeah, the first time that happens is after the fight with Kai. She goes into what I like to call the fight coma, and she's just kind of like walking around in a haze. And is even more stupid than she normally is. She was, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, like like the uh, yeah, they actually like both uh, Kai and her little sister start calling her Baka Master <laughs> when she's in that state. Like she was like a zombie because yep. she. Uh, I think she had like too much. Like she had, she was feeling too much adrenaline, too mm -hmm. much of that whatever emotion she was looking mm -hmm. for. Like she was high on that, mm -hmm. and and like she was just coming down from it. And yeah, it's it's the hangover. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, it goes for like days. So I find it interesting that when we see first see Kai, it was like at at the beach, and she was doing like a like a little women's fighting competition. Yeah, yeah a random women's fight tournament on the beach because uh -huh. this town is full of crazy people. Uh <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> like like every I think this town just like operates under fighting game logic. Like having uh like like tournaments and fist fights or whatever are as normal as having like like a farmer's market or something. You just where you have do we have room for it? Yeah, we'll put it here. Seriously, man, seriously. And so Kai and Maki are introduced there. And for some reason, Maki couldn't fully fight with Kai, but Maki was like, I want to fight her. Mm-hmm. Because well, Kai no exhibiting <laughs> similar fighting techniques as her yeah she was in that yeah. area yeah she was fighting in, like in the air same as maki uh her being a luchador that's kind of her bread and butter um the reason why the fight didn't happen is because uh maki i think she needed a mask in order to participate and got one from this other tiny this was a tiny woman now who gave her this mask under the condition that she referred to herself as she's in a mask and Maki <laughs> called, decided to call herself fight man instead. So while Renge and this other tiny woman were like fighting, they accidentally hit the self-destruct button. <laughs> that was so for, for some reason. reason. That for was some reason. reason. <laughs> that mask is a self-destruct. I, know. I, for, 
That is the weirdest bit because I forget that's going to happen every time I watch this series. <laughs> yeah, like for some reason, there's a self destruct detonator in the mask. For... Why? Exactly. Why? <laughs> And because of that, Maki was put out of commission and she couldn't really fight with Kai. Mm -hmm. But fate, fate brought them back together because of Kaori Sakiyama. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. So Sakiyama was roped into going into a wrestling tournament mm -hmm. and she was going to be in like a tag team yeah unfortunately her partner got injured yeah and uh sakiyama wasn't interested so she tried to pass the <laughs> well, well suffice to say maki kind of causes the problem yeah 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 and then so sakiyama didn't want to be in it and then Maki didn't want to be in it, but because of this person being injured, they're like, okay, out of obligation, we'll, we'll be in this wrestling tournament for you because it was our fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's so funny because the girl, she's like, all you have to do, you don't have to win. You do not have to win. All you have to do is pose and flash your panties. <laughs> That's what she said! Yeah, yeah. That's why they were fighting in skirts. <laughs> And it turns out that Maki and Sakiyama were like really good at fighting. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the the other thing is that like I think their first set of opponents, uh, there, there's there's some personal stuff between one of them and uh, Sakiyama. Yeah, they gave a backstory for Sakiyama. Why she's so prideful? Mm -hmm. I like that because you know we like Sakiyama. We like Sakiyama. yeah, like. If, if you've reached this point in the series, chances are you're already endeared to Sakiyama because in spite of how prideful she is, things don't always go her way. It's not like there's some there's like a bunch of life elements that kind of like feed into her ego. Quite the opposite. Uh, everything seems to work against her. Yeah. So her, her pride is very much hard won. And uh, the, if, if that didn't already tug on your heartstrings, then kind of getting this backstory where she was kind of working to overcome bullies in high school and her success spited them to the point that uh, she was like assaulted by them. You, uh, yeah, I think, I think like the real death knell for me, like the point where I was just like, okay, I, I'm going to crawl into this computer and, and fight this lady for her is when you find out she's deaf in one ear because of that attack. Like that shit fucked me up. Yeah, that was that like hit me in the heart. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my god, you're deaf in one ear? What? Like, yeah, just, and it wasn't it wasn't like a random accident or something like that. It's because people literally attacked her. Yeah, and this person was literally digging into old wounds. Mm -hmm. This person was being psychologically vicious. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, she was probably, like, low-grade psychopath or something like that because this is, like, shit was just evil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, she had no remorse <laughs> for it, and it was made me... Was mad at Sakiyama for it. Yeah! I was like, Sakiyama, Maki, beat her ass! <laughs> like, I really wanted Maki to beat her ass because I really mm -hmm. thought that Sakiyama was not mentally ready for it. Like she, she kind of wasn't. Like she even had to admit herself she was honestly scared. Mm -hmm. And even Maki was like, "I'll hand her for you. Mm -hmm. I'll take her on." And Sakiyama's like, "Nah, I got this." Yeah, where she uh, reveals her special move. <gasps> oh yeah. The one that she like built up, she was training to mm -hmm. use in hockey. Yeah, yeah, it was a, a key strike, like the first one you see in this series. Actually, they call it like reverse osmosis or something like that. I think it's like 
you use key to disrupt the natural flow in the body, like the natural flowing of things in your body, which I think is why a bunch of water shoots out of you <laughs> every time you get hit by it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was weird because that, that seemed like a really high level move. Like that seemed to be like beyond anything Maki was doing. Right. Like it's kind of what I was talking about, where I was saying the strides uh, Kauri makes would easily make her like the main character of any other show. And it's probably why she's a fan favorite of anyone who watches this. <laughs> and then after that, they go into the next fight. And um, this is this is the reason why I'm like Sakiyama because it seems like Kaori Sakiyama found herself. She she found her groove mm-hmm. in wrestling and taking over the mic and talking smack. It. <laughs> she she had a, a live mic while sitting in the audience. <laughs> Wait, was that her own mic? Like, I don't know if she did that herself or if someone gave if someone gave that to her, give them a raise. <laughs> she found her element. She found mm-hmm. her element with wrestling. <laughs> yeah, she's really the perfect fit because I think in any other scenario, you would expect her personality to not be so abrasive, for, for her to not be so like loud, outspoken prideful and just like combative but like every every part of her just fits perfect in pro wrestling Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she gets to she gets to have that fame she wants so i guess it was kind of like even though it wasn't necessarily the end of her story you still kind of get a happy ending of sorts for her right like i was happy for her that she finally got her fame Mm -hmm. and it's funny how she started out aspiring to be a model, which is an occupation where you need to take care of your body, make sure that it's pristine for the jobs. And mm-hmm. she, ends up, she ends up being a wrestler where you get roughed up. <laughs> yeah, though it's still not necessarily out of the cards for her. She's nope. just got to like... Maybe avoid some hardcore matches or, you know, maybe she just can't do any swimsuits for fear of scarring. But Mm -hmm. other than that, she seems to recover, uh, you know, very well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, after getting beat by Maki, she just gets right back up the next day and challenges Mm -hmm. her again, you know? Well, yeah, that's another thing. She's definitely got the endurance for wrestling, too. (laughs) Speaking of like wrestling and tournaments, mm-hmm. can we talk about the was it the Fukumichi tournament? Oh, uh, the Fukumichi ranking. Yeah. Well, it was both ranking and tournament. So my suspicion as to like why this the city they're in seems to be like a haven for street fighters is I think because of the the Fukumichi ranking. Like, uh, not everyone there fighting knows about it. It's just a place you can go if you want to punch someone in the mouth. But I'm sure it attracted a lot of people looking to kind of, like, make a living through that ranking. As we get at least one character, um, I think his name was Yashiki, the uh, key user, who is specifically in the ranking to, you know, make a living. Um. And, and they set it up pretty well in that uh, Fukumichi's kind of like in the background watching all the street fights in the prior episodes. But it's it's sort of a weird ahead of it, simultaneously ahead of its time, but sort of that bit of the future that everyone was expecting, where it's like a streaming service, mm-hmm. except you use it to watch street fights. Uh, that seems to be where Fukumichi gets his money, and then he pays the fighters based on. Uh, uh, who they fight and whether or not they win. I honestly thought the Fukumichi rankings was mm-hmm. random. Another random thing. 
<laughs> well, it's secretly been going. There's enough there to indicate that it's secretly been going on in the background. And what little I read of the manga kind of gives me the impression they set it up a bit better there. That mm. they uh, use it to not. O- what I appreciate about it is that they use it to not only bring back and match up characters we've uh, seen thus far, but it, to introduce some new ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like uh, I mentioned, I think, I don't know if it was uh, in our previous attempt to record it, if I mentioned uh, the fight between uh, Maki and Kai is arguably the best in the series. Oh, yeah, you mentioned it in the previous uh, yeah. record, but not this one. Okay, so that there's there's two in that running um, for me. One is that fight, and the other is the fight between Kai and Kinjiro. Explain it to the audience. Okay, so uh, we've already been introduced to Kinjiro, the guy who feels like he's from a completely different anime, and uh, Kai, the Sky Star, the only person able to equal Maki in the air. Um, both of whom get pulled into the Fukumichi ranking. Um, so the Fukumichi rank, the Fukumichi ranking is kind of going on in the background. You become a ranker by defeating a ranker. You take their rank, <clears throat> and with it, every win you get gets you a prize based on the rank of the person you defeated. Um, so. Outside of the ranking itself, Fukumichi, after he's pulled in all these characters we've been introduced to, then puts on a tournament within the ranking to kind of uh, match up the best he had before with these newcomers to you know further an agenda that remains kind of mysterious up until about the last episode. Um. One of the big matches in this is the fight between Kai and Kinjiro. And uh, talked about this uh, series kind of living and dying on like not just the fights, but the fights themselves being really, mu- really very much about impact. And mm-hmm. some of the hardest hits you will ever see in this series happens in this fight between the two of them. Think of uh, the hallmarks of which being a like. Kai vaulting off of an overpass to hit Kinjiro with the Sky Twister press, and then Kinjiro using a truck to uh, hit uh, Kai with like a vaulting punch. Damn! But, yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> they are all over the place. It is a street fight in every sense of the word because they're both like making heavy use of the environment in ways you didn't really see prior. That's right. They're going all out because they really wanted to rank up and they're both each other's uh, obstacle. Yeah, they're both both of them. Their primary uh, focus is trying to fight Maki. Yeah, because um, they didn't even have a place yet, right? They didn't even have a ranking. No, they both got a ranking. Um, Kenjiro was formally brought in by Fukumichi. I think he took like rank 11 or something like that in like the, uh, the low teens. And then Kai took the rank from uh, Yashiki because oh, Yashiki, crazy. yeah, Yashiki attacked Kai because he thought she was the air master. That's right. And Yashiki was like, what rank nine. Yeah, he was rank nine prior to being defeated. So he went and sort of tricked the guy who was ranked eight so he could take his rank from him. <laughs> so there's these guys over here. And then as one eye said, the Fukumichi rankings gave everybody opportunity to introduce these other characters. All these people, they're just so different they're like from all, all over the world i literally thought of street fighter mm-hmm. <laughs> when I, thought- that, I bet i bet specifically that that bit on the roof where you had all the yeah. fighters gathered <laughs> yeah that's my favorite part of the series honest to god <laughs> and they all um specialize in certain styles techniques yeah they all had their own thing going on and i'm just wondering like why are you here what's your story money 
They're trying to make some money. But why do you need money? <laughs> to, to, to eat. <laughs> they got to live. And you think people like that can keep day jobs? <laughs> it's like they live and die on fighting and like here's this like means through which they can make a living off of it. I mean, like, L- 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 be, be honest with me. If there was like another part of town you could travel to where everyone's like podcasting. And it's like, okay, if you make a podcast and this many people look at it like immediately, not not like you got to go through an algorithm and then set up like sponsorship and this, that and the other thing, (laughs) like literally eyeballs to dollars in this part of town. Like everyone goes in there to watch you record your show live, right? You telling me you wouldn't go there and do it? I would totally go there. Mm -hmm. I'd be in there with you. Yeah. Easy money, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, you, and Spirit could go out there and kick the shit out of everyone, figuratively. <laughs> but like, uh, okay. So the reason why I'm thinking this is because, uh, you remember Yuki Minaguchi? Oh, the scary lady. Yeah. Yeah, the scary lady. The scary lady who looks like she's a doctor. The scary lady who looks like she's a doctor. And she's got money already. Hmm. I was like wondering about her. I was like, why are you here? She sort of reminded me of Maki where she, okay, so Yuki has an RBF too. You know, she looks Mm -hmm. like she has no emotion. She looks bored when she's fighting. Yeah, up and well, yeah, up until the fight with Maki, she just looks, yeah, really, really bored. So I thought she was like Maki where she's looking for that that thing to ignite that fire in her. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it. It seemed that 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 was her story. It is, but I don't know. It's definitely not the same sort of combat high that Maki is seeking. It's decidedly more vicious in her. Like, I'm kind of wondering if maybe she has some, like, psychotic tendencies or something like that. Because she is just, everything about her is violent. Yeah. Like, she gets a little bloody with her attacks. Well, yeah, her primary means of, like, her primary means of striking her are, like, knife hands. Mm -hmm. Like, literal stabbing hands that literally stab. It's not even like 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 a half fist or something like that where it's still a strike. It's just like a pointed strike. So maybe you hit like pressure points or you isolate something like a bone or something like that. No, no, no. Her she's literally stabbing you with her hands. Those those nails go in. And so do bits of the fingers. She literally yeah. scared me. Yeah, she did too. She she's a bit extreme for me. Like all the I don't want to say happy-go-lucky, but it was a little upbeat. The story was getting upbeat. You know, you just be introduced to all these characters. They're kind mm-hmm. of goofy. Uh, well, yeah, they're all, like, eccentric and sort of crazy. Yeah, the, the fights themselves are violent, but the people aren't really. Like, I think I think the, the key thing here is, like, like, sadism, which doesn't seem to be especially present except for you know, maybe like Maki in that one sense where she was fighting Kauri and losing her goddamn mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, and, and that scene is meant to be uncomfortable. Whereas like everyone else, they're fighting, they're hitting the hell out of each other, but there isn't like, there doesn't seem to be any sort of like glee in the actual pain being inflicted. It's just, yeah, I'm fighting. I'm doing a good thing. This is awesome. Whereas like, Mina seemed to mean uh, Yuki seemed to really be kind of reveling in the violence itself. Yeah. In a way that the other characters didn't. Yeah. And I was a little worried for Maki. Mm-hmm. Like, Maki, you're going to be okay, girl? Like, damn. Yeah. She took more hits in that fight than I think she'd taken in. <laughs> In the entire series prior, like it's a weird thing with Yuki. She kind of does to Maki what Maki had been doing to everyone else. Yeah. And then, like, fortunately, Maki gets right back up and then she has another opponent to fight. (laughs) 
Yeah, that was so. It's it's around the time the Fukumichi ranking starts that I think they're kind of uh, hitting fast forward on the series because I want to say it's around this time you start getting a lot of incomplete arcs, and one of them being one of them being Maki never kind of getting that revenge fight with Yuki, right. Uh, I like like another being that uh, Kai, even though she basically resolves to you know go back into the world of wrestling and conquer that before she tries to face Maki again, it happens in this way that you don't really get a resolution. She just kind of wins the ti- wins the tag titles off screen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's not we don't get to you know follow her, watch her do that, and then kind of train with Maki. And you know, like we were saying with uh, Shinosuke, he never we we don't get to see him come back from China. Uh, I think another with the second to last episode, you find out that uh, um, Yashiki and Skino are actually cousins and that Skino used to bully him. And I was thinking, okay, Yashiki's going to get his revenge, but no, he just kind of like regresses into the st- that state he was when he was getting picked on. And I'm like, okay, that seems like another loop we didn't get the, you know, close. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like it seemed like it literally just got opened for us. Like, okay, here's another character arc, and they don't do anything with it. Uh, you sort of get a closed arc with um, uh, uh, Kinjiro once he kind of comes out of his funk after losing to Yuki, but we didn't. We don't really see anything happen beyond that. You know, a lot of characters just kind of like show up for one more gag, and then they're gone. And I think I, if I had to point a finger at it, I don't know for certain because the very little of the Airmaster manga was uh, translated and fan translated at that. It never got a licensed release. Um, it's that the manga was still going on when the series kind of came to an end, but everything about the series kind of indicated that the Eternal was like the last boss so to speak if we still stick with video game logic Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you still had the you know eternal to deal with so it made sense that maki doesn't win that fight um it it, it definitely felt like the end of a season rather than the end of a series even though they kind of closed the loop so to speak when i was watching this I was mm-hmm. surprised that was the last episode. I was like, wait, mm-hmm. what? What? No, 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 no. There has to be more. And there is no more episodes because it really felt like there was like an open ending. But now that you mentioned all the stuff you said, it did sound like they were tying loose ends, but mm-hmm. characters. Or they just left them. Or were setting up plot points for season two. Right. And like season Shinosuke. two never came. Yes, Shinosuke being a really big one. Like Shinosuke felt like he was going to like come up again. Kai felt like she was going to come up again. Mm-hmm. And we have Maki's younger half sister. It seemed like mm-hmm. we we're going to see some development from her. Mm-hmm. And because Maki lost twice to two other people it sort of felt like they were going to come back again and she was going to fight them later on mm-hmm. well no she avenged the fight with the uh virtual fighter looking dude but um not not the she never had a revenge fight with yuki no <laughs> yeah um what was I going to say in that regard? It's a weird thing, too, because as incomplete as the series ultimately feels, I feel like everything they did with the Eternal was actually like really kind of kind of deep and interesting. Uh, and they play it kind of vague with him, sort of in the same way that they kind of play a lot of uh, Julieta's story kind of vaguely. Mm-hmm. Like they don't really spell out. Um, they They show you things, but they don't really tell you. And, and not in that way that telling you really fills the gap, so to speak. Like, they play it vague with him, and they sort of almost, like, cryptically speak about the Eternal. Though, in the case of the Eternal, it makes a bit more sense considering how grandiose the character kind of is. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> word. <laughs> it's the best word I can think to describe him because he's literally the reason the Fukumichi ranking exists. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Fukumichi literally put this ranking together to find someone who could defeat the Eternal. Uh, not only that, but there's like uh, almost like creepy pasta style like implications that once the uh, that initial tournament that Fukumichi put together within the ranking ended, the Eternal went out and started challenging everyone ranked within the top ten who wasn't already out of commission. As you get these like like shots on the video screen of uh, the virtual, I think it's the virtual fighter guy. That fat guy that uh, Yoshiki tricked. Um, I don't know if the ninja was in there too. There was one more, or maybe two more. Two more of the people who would have been in the top 10 all just kind of like laid out and screwed up. And not only that, but when Maki goes to fight the Eternal, Yuki's lying there passed out. So he defeated her as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's also in that last episode you get uh, the entirety of uh, Maki's backstory and the other half of the reason why she probably went with fighting outside of her having some familiarity of it due to her father is also just an outlet for the sheer amount of bad feelings she's feeling, not because her mother, not just because her mother passed away, uh, but also because during her sort of like last. And again, I don't know what the proper term for a gymnastics competition, whatever is. She fell. And it was she it the show indicates that it was literally the last thing her mother saw. Mm. So she's got some psychological like like hang ups, trauma, what have you, associated with gymnastics, even though her mother had no bad feelings about it whatsoever. I think um, Maki's got this idea in her head that had she not um, had she not fallen, her mother would have still lived. Yeah, because she was uh, telling her mom, like, if she wins, her mom has to live. I mean, yeah, she's her, like, if I win this, you'll live. If I if I go to the Olympics, you'll pull through, right? Like, she was like bargaining with it at that point. Yeah, she's banking on that. Which I think is like a literal, one of the literal steps of like, um, what is it? Um, just kind of like dealing with like grief or trauma or something like that. Like the last step is acceptance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, like I think subconsciously she has that thought in her head. And the fighting kind of became an outlet. It was a really good outlet for her. Mm-hmm. Because she still got this. She still got to, uh, you know, keep all the stuff she learned from her mom in doing mm-hmm. that, and maybe to some degree develop some sort of closeness with her dad, but also just kind of find an outlet for everything, both what she was getting through gymnastics and something, some way to channel all the bad she was feeling. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like after her fight with Eternal, and she's like, she's still happy. She's like, yeah, satisfied. She has this weird sense of fulfillment. Yeah, like with your explanation and connecting everything, that that ending makes sense. Yeah, I think it's actually really well done, even though it doesn't it doesn't really offer you the ending you're probably looking for, especially on your first viewing. But I think there's like a this is where I'm going to potentially sound like a crazy person, a deeply spiritual sort of context to that fight with the Eternal. And obviously with what the Eternal might be. Uh, suffice to say that Maki isn't just fighting the video game style last boss of this series over the course of not only this fight but this series in general she's quite literally learning to fly and I I don't even obviously in the figurative sense but also in the literal sense 
because there's at least two points in that fight where she literally defies gravity. She was adapting. She was learning new techniques, pushing her limits. She was literally creating human capacity that didn't exist prior to that fight. And I think um, my sort of like YouTuber style theory about what the eternal is, is that his existence exists to collect abilities like that. Because even the eternal himself was doing things that didn't seem possible in the series. Like he's the only person in the series with an honest to God projectile attack. That isn't just something being thrown. Like he does it at least two times. He swings his arms. I think the first time he does it creates, I don't know if it was a key strike or air current, but it like slices through a concrete pillar. He was an interesting one because Mm -hmm. when he was like kind of explaining his backstory, like he was saying that it started with his ancestors and his ancestors were like the number one. All the way to 15, I think. Yeah. And then it's like, I got the impression that like for every descendant, the predecessor would somehow channel all their experience mm-hmm. to that. Well, yeah, that's what that uh, ghost caller girl was there for. Uh, the impression I got, because I think what he says to Maki when asked, he yeah. says, like, I am, I am what guards true strength and what will pass it on. It, it kind of gives me the impression that the eternal, the mantle itself is less one of heritage and more one you take Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as in you become the eternal by defeating the previous eternal. And it seems like it would hold up if only because like once he absorbs the other uh, 14 through that, like ghost lady, uh, he starts displaying other crazy abilities, including the capacity to fight Maki in the air. Yeah. Which I think is, you know, they were abilities of the previous Eternals. Yeah, I guarantee. And each, yeah. and each Eternal had some ability that seemed to defy reality. Um, there's also the bit where Yuki asks him if he's human. It was either Yuki or Maki. One of them asks him if he's human. And he says he's like beyond that now. Like he may have been at some point, but he's not anymore. And that was the last episode of the series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which I guess I, I guess if you're looking at it like I do, it's amazing, but it, it pissed. So I did I did I went through the series the second time I watched. I went through the series with the uh, co-host I had on my um, former uh, anime podcast, mm-hmm. and 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 this uh, that last episode made them mad. <laughs> Why they 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 were just complaining that it didn't make any sense. And I guess if you're looking for like a traditional close to the narrative, like they wanted to like Maki to show up, win the fight, and we all live happily ever after. The end. Yay. And I mean, I mean, and I, I'm I'm kind of downplaying the want for the traditional narrative. Uh it, it's reasonable to be upset with this ending. Yeah, it is. It is. But I loved it. I fucking adored it. I was a little confused by the ending, but mm-hmm. I was also thinking like, oh, well, this is the anime. I'm pretty sure there's a manga. I'm pretty sure the manga yeah. continued after this. So that was my thought process. Yes. The um, but- anime came out in 2003. The manga started in 97 and finished in 2006. So it went on for years after the anime. Uh, so I was like thinking, oh, yeah, the story totally continued on. Totally. Mm-hmm. And I learned that that was the last episode for the anime, and I was like, "Oh, wow! They just left the the fans hanging there." Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but hearing your explanation of how everything got tied together, analyzing it in a spiritual perspective, it makes sense. It's very mm-hmm. satisfying. It's like, all right, I'm good. I'm good. There's, there's actually a lot there. It's just kind of like vaguely depicted um and if you're what you're if you've got an expectation as to what you think is going to happen in the end this is definitely going to throw you off Mm -hmm. 
but I think there's a lot to chew on in there. I mean, when I first started watching this anime, Air Master, I was like, eh, unsure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I like, can understand. And then, like, it just ends with something deep. It's like, oh, mm. well then. Surprisingly deep, I guess, is one of the ways I one of the ways you can describe this anime. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But but the emphasis is on the surprise and not so much the deep. Like there's some stuff where I question. I'm like, I want to know more, mm-hmm. but I'm, like, I'm kind of satisfied with it because it's like, eh, the story was good. The story was good. Like I do want to know more about Julieta. I do want to know more about Chinosuke. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm kind of satisfied with Kai. I just mm-hmm. want to see how well she does afterwards. Yeah, like even if like you get even in the instances where you got kind of complete arcs for the characters, they you've they you've they've endeared themselves to you enough that you want to see more of them. Like mm-hmm. even though like uh, you know, Kauri's kind of found her niche in pro wrestling and could probably kind of like live a lot of her, her ideals and dreams through it. It doesn't mean we want to stop watching her. That is correct. Sakiyama! Sakiyama! <laughs> it's kind of like a, um, I guess like a, like a minor goal of mine to see, even if it's in just like the most tiniest, tiniest of ways possible, some sort of resurgence in uh, interest in Air Master. So I talk about it everywhere I can. <laughs> you want to bring it back. <laughs> I'd like that very much. I mean, that's, I just, I it. miss, I love this anime and I just, I miss anime like it. Ah. It was the, you know, this was the kind of stuff I was really all about. And it's a strange thing now, thanks to, uh, Netflix airing Baki and then also getting uh Kingan Ashura and stuff like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure taking off all these things that like like that that subgenre of martial arts anime like really like brutal ass martial arts anime kind of existed in this weird niche especially in the states for the longest of times and now there's like a small but like vocal following for this sort of thing. So I think it would be like a really good time for people to notice Air Master again. Mm, that is so true. I don't watch Baki or Jojo Bizarre Adventures, mm-hmm. but I kind of know about them. And yeah, Air Master is totally mesh with the people who yeah. like this. Totally. Audience, if you guys like Baki and Jojo, Watch Air Master. You're gonna mm-hmm. like this. Wanna? <laughs> you're thinking ahead. You're thinking, <laughs> you got the big picture going on. It's just something I'd like to see. It's it's purely I'm purely doing it out of self interest. I have no I have no altruism. <laughs> <laughs> I just like maybe 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 this is like the long way around of like getting someone to translate the manga for me so I can get the entire story. <laughs> Actually, let me let me see if it even exists. Um because it's probably not in paperback but probably digitally. Uh let me see. Let me see. I'm going to check out this website I've been hearing a lot about from Anime tubers. Mm-hmm. This website called Bookwalker. Oh, isn't that the one they're all like plugging? Yeah, they all are. Um, yeah, they are. They're all plugging this. So it's pretty much like they have pretty much all the manga that's been scan leaded on these websites and more. Nah. <laughs> what, of course. What? What? Oh yeah, it like barely any of it got translated. Oh come on now, you guys should you should translate this. Like, come on, guys. Wow, they got like some 
random stuff, but not Air Master. Fine. I see how it is. They don't have Iron Walk John, John on here either. <laughs> and that upsets me. That one's really hard to find. But I guess I can uh, save that for another day. Yeah, yeah. And for everyone who has been listening to podcasts across worlds, it is time for the paw question. Every episode we do, we ask the audience a question. If the platform allows it, you can answer in the comments. If not, we have a Discord. The link is available in the description. You can click on it, and then there's going to be a thread for Podcast Cross Worlds and Paul Question. From there, you can read the question, and you can answer either in the anime or the manga. Now, in episode 10, the Paul Question is Have you seen the anime God of High School, the one that's based off of the webtoons? If so, what do you think about it? If not, why haven't you watched it? Let us know. I'm Lihua Superfina, host of Podcasts Across Worlds. You can find me on all social media platforms at Lehua Superfina. Weekly, I upload videos about video games, manga, and candy masks on youtube.com slash Lehua Superfina. I also stream every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays on twitch.tv slash Lehua Superfina. I am uh, Lionel, a.k.a. One-Eye, a.k.a. Jumper Cables. Uh, don't get too confused if you find me being called something else somewhere else. I just have too many nicknames. But uh, when I'm not here co-hosting on one of Lahua's shows, I'm doing any number of shows on Hey Listen Radio. You can put heylistenradio.com in and you'll find it there. Or where we upload directly is soundcloud.com slash heylistenradio. I have a now dead anime podcast there. And we do have the live Hey Listen Radio show coming out weekly. On Twitter, I am currently not Jumper Cables at Old Taku Connect. And that concludes our episode of Podcasts Across Worlds. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep reading manga, keep watching anime, and keep listening to Podcasts Across Worlds. We'll see you on the next episode. Huge thanks to my Patreons and channel members for making this video possible. If you also want to be part of the Superfina party, you can click over here or become a channel member. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And I do stream live on Twitch every Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Hope to see you guys there and I will see you on the next video. This bump.